Hello, good day everybody. This is Dr. Sanjay Sanyal, Professor, Department Chair. This time I'm going to demonstrate a few clinical correlations pertaining to the cervical vertebral column and the lumbar vertebral column. So what you see in front of you is the articulated vertebral column. Up here we have the cervical region. The seven cervical vertebrae are there and you can see the cervical spinal nerves are coming out and you can also see the vertebral artery going through the transverse foramen on both the sides. So this is the cervical region. We shall mention a few clinical correlations pertaining to the cervical region because of its extreme mobility. Down below we have the thoracic region. You can see the thoracic mild thoracic kyphosis which is normal and you can see the thoracic spinal nerves emerging through the intervertebral foramen. And further lower down this is the lumbar region. You can see the slight lumbar lordosis which also is normal and you can see the lumbar spinal nerves emerging with the intervertebral discs in between each vertebrae. We shall mention the clinical correlations pertaining to the lumbar region also because this is a weight-bearing region and it also has got a considerable mobility. So therefore, we shall focus on some few salient clinical correlations pertaining to the cervical vertebral column and the lumbar vertebral column. So let's start with the cervical region. Suppose a person gets a severe flexion injury of the cervical spine. We can get what are known as the stages of flexion injuries, stage one, two, three, four. Flexion injury means when the cervical vertebra bends forward. In stage one, we have rupture of the ligaments, especially the interspinous ligament and the intertransverse ligaments and maybe partial ligamentum flavor. Stage two is associated with up to 25% translation of the cervical vertebral body one above the other. Translation means about 25% of the width of the vertebral body moves forward on top of the vertebra below. That is called translation. So stage two is up to 25% translation. Of course, it will be associated with the ligament tears. There will also be bulging of the nucleus pulposus. Stage three is up to 50% translation. That means 50% of the width of the vertebral body has moved forward in relation to the vertebral body below. And stage four is up to 100% translation. That means the whole vertebral body has moved completely away from the vertebra below and it is also associated with facet jumping. So these are the stages of cervical flexion spine injury. This is a lateral x-ray of a cervical spine of a patient with stage 3 flexion injury of the cervical spine. If you take a close look at the x-ray, you will find that the C5 cervical vertebra has translated approximately 33% over C6. So this is a stage 3 cervical flexion spine injury. Then we can have herniation of the nucleus pulposus, the one which is traditionally referred to as prolapse of intervertebral disc. We usually get herniation of the nucleus pulposus in the lower cervical region. Classically, it occurs at the junction between a mobile part of the vertebral column and the fixed part of the vertebral column. And this also happens when there's a flexion injury. The herniation of the nucleus pulposus is usually posterolateral, which I shall demonstrate in the lumbar region, but it can also occur in the cervical region. Excessive cervical manipulation, especially chiropractic manipulation, has been documented to produce dissection aneurysm of the vertebral artery, which you can see running, running through the transverse foramen. And this dissecting aneurysm can produce posterior cerebral stroke. If we have extension injury of the cervical spine, then we can get tear of the ligaments, anterior longitudinal ligament, and we can also have injury to the spinous processes and the lamina of the cervical vertebra. If we have extension of the head and neck and then flexion, that is called whiplash injury, then we can get what is known as a central cord syndrome, where there will be sacral sparing. Now let's come down to the lumbar region. The lumbar region is also a weight bearing region, so therefore it is prone to degenerative osteoarthritis, wear and tear, osteopenia, osteoporosis. Apart from that, we can get what is known as spondylolisthesis. What exactly is spondylolisthesis? A degenerative break of the pars interarticularis between the superior and inferior articular facets. 
then we get what is known as slipping of the L5 vertebra on S1 and that is called spondylolisthesis. For this to occur, there has to be bilateral spondylolysis, lumbar L5. That means both sides, the pars interarticularis of L5 should be degenerated and broken, which will allow the whole lumbar vertebra to move forward on the S1. That is called lumbar spondylolisthesis. We can also have herniation of the nucleus pulposus. And you can see here in this model, they have given us a representation of the herniation of the nucleus pulposus. This herniation also typically occurs in the posterior lateral region and it also compresses the emerging spinal nerve. The rule of thumb to be remembered is the herniating nucleus pulposus, whether it's in the cervical region or in the lumbar region, it compresses the nerve of the higher numerical value, which means that if there's a herniation of the nucleus pulposus as shown here, between L4 and L5 vertebra, it will compress the L5 spinal nerve. Similarly, if there's a herniation of the nucleus pulposus, let's say between C6 and C7, it will compress the C7 spinal nerve. So that is about the herniation of nucleus pulposus. Apart from that, as I've already mentioned, the lumbar vertebrae is highly prone to degenerative wear and tear and it also produces osteophytes, which can produce lumbar stenosis, which can be accurately diagnosed by myelogram or MRI. And when we have a patient with lumbar stenosis, one of the extreme forms of treatment will be to do laminectomy or pedicle transection in order to relieve the compression of the spinal cord and the spinal nerves. So these are some salient points about the clinical correlations pertaining to the cervical region and the lumbar region. Thank you very much for watching. This is Dr. Sanjay Sanya signing out. If you have any questions or comments, please put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day.